Shana, welcome everyone. Before uh, I begin with the prayer and then start the teaching tonight, uh, in the, when I first started the Wednesday night sessions online here, I had a picture of Dr. Lamza, and some of you have not seen it because we have several new people on, and I'd like to show it again. I just found it again today, and I thought I'd like to show it. This is this picture was taken in uh, around 1961-62, and um, it's I've forgotten where he was, but he had what they call the bread of the presence that that they used in the uh, tabernacle for the priests that was put on the table of the bread of the bread on the table where the bread of the presence was that the priest ate and oh my gosh once a year doc, dr lamza's niece nina would send it to me so i could show it when i was teaching here in atlanta at uh, for the ministerial students they um they loved it when that bread came in because they were eating the only the bread that was to be given to the priest the recipe for this is in the book of Leviticus. I believe it's in the first chapter. It's been a while since I've read it. And it's called Cade. And this is a wonderful picture. It's one of my favorite pictures of Dr. Lamza. My, the number one favorite. I'd like to show it to you right now so you can see it. There he is. And there's the bread of the presence. He's pointing at it. And and there's two loaves of it there. And it's flat and it's in the center is nothing but layers of thick butter. And, and it was done in the Near Eastern style and everything. It was, it melts in your mouth. I never tasted anything like it as the bread of this presence. And this is what the priests used to eat in the tabernacle. And then they used to make it for when they built the temple too. And the recipe is in of the book of Leviticus. Okay, that's still my favorite picture of him. Now, before I begin, be, begin tonight, uh, I'm gonna say the prayer and then I'm gonna read something from, I read it to you when I first started the book of the Revelation, but I need to reread it because of what we are approaching now in that sixth chapter. We have already broken some of the seals and released the horses. So I'm before I go into the because when we read the whole sixth chapter, hopefully we'll do that tonight. And it's good. You're going to find some things there. They're going to be very controversial. So this is why I wanted to read this to you again. But I'll do that after I do the opening affirmative prayer in Aramaic. Al Haile, the modern Ishua Mishicha, Misharenan, Milap. Milte, the Maria Alaha Haya. All right. And what I wanted to read to you, those of you who have this book, the commentary on, on um, it starts with James and clear through to Revelation. I'm going to read to you what I read in the beginning when I first started this. This is something that was not written by me, but Dr. D.S. Russell, former general secretary of the Baptist Union of Great Britain. And in his book is called The Divine Disclosure, which I have his book here. He says, the subject of Jewish apocalyptic is not everyone's idea of a good read. <laughs> and it isn't. This is why I avoid it most of the time. Its origins are obscure, its style is strange, and its subject matter seems to raise more problems than it solves. Its pronostications, moreover, have for centuries been the happy hunting ground for fundamentalist Christians, and they're still doing it to this day. They, you will hear more about Paul and the book of the Revelation than anything else, except some of the horrible scriptures that they take from the Old Testament and about the devil and about Satan, which they don't understand either. But it's been the happy hunting ground, as he puts it here, uh, for fundamental Christians and sects that have had a peculiar fascination for the cranks and charlatans 
with their charts of ages and dispensations. I used to have my own chart when I first became, uh, left the Roman Catholic Church and went into the Assemblies of God. And it says here, they had their own uh, charts of ages and dispensations into which history is believed to be divided as a prelude to the end. And that's not at all what the book of the Revelation is talking about. They speak of the rapture, where you'll be raptured up in the air and taken and everything that's going to go wrong on the earth. You won't have to experience it. And that's not true. That is not true. Okay. Who point to an awful battle of Armageddon as the necessary prelude to the second coming of Christ. Who discuss theological truth in terms of premillennialism and postmillennialism and point to the catastrophic and devastating end of the world at a precise date and in a precise circumstance foretold in scripture. Not true. But he's explaining how uh, that's mis totally misunderstood. And what I said here then, I said, the author of the revelation does not claim that he's writing is based on actual facts. The book must be treated as a work based largely on imagery and visions, as is the case of certain passages in Daniel, Isaiah, Ezekiel. And then it's also coming from different books in the Bible. That's what you've got to understand. It is the writer who puts certain things in there. And that's what we're going to be going into tonight, because we're going to read certain things. And I'm going to tell you them when we get to it. And I had to give that to you again tonight as a reminder, because some of you weren't here when I started the book of the Revelation. So let's go to the sixth chapter of the Revelation. All right. Now, remember, this is vision number two. There are seven basic visions. And I gave you the chapters and verses for those visions. We'll probably stay in this vision two for tonight and next Wednesday, I think. So here we are. Because six and seven, part of five, six and seven, and eight in the first verse belong in vision two. So let's start. I saw when the lamb opened one of the seven seals. I'm going to go back, even though we did two or three of the horses last week, because I'm going to go a little deeper with it now. And I saw when the lamb opened one of the seven seals. And I heard one of the four lambs. It translates it as animals, which is OK to translate like that, because what the word means, but it means living creatures living creatures Be and because the word is from the word living comes from the root word living living creatures saying in a voice as of thunder or like thunder and what did he say ta ta means come 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 forth the ta means come 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 forward come forward ta and look or see, either way you want to translate that. And he says, so, now sometimes I put my translation in here and there. So I looked and beheld a white horse. Now we're going to get four horses. And it's called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. <laughs> That's not biblical. The four horsemen of the, of the apocalypse. That was done by a Spanish novelist, and he wrote a special book on the four horsemen of the apocalypse, but not really following the book of the Revelation at all, because he, he only thought of it as war and all, which is true, but he kept it all in that. And then they made two motion pictures, of one in the earlier days when everything was black and white on the print, and then in, when they did it in Technicolor, they filmed his book twice. So made it for Hollywood, made it. Of course, it was done strictly Hollywood style. So 
here, well, I want to go deeper with you. Okay, let's go over the four horses. Now, where did he get this idea of seeing these horses? Comes from Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah, the first chapter, beginning with the eighth verse, all the way down to verse 11. You can actually start in seven if you want to, uh, if you're going to read uh, Zechariah. He's the last of what we call the minor prophets. Zechariah talks about the horses and the horses he mentions, it doesn't say four, but it does mention three, but there may have been more. And there was a red, reddish brown horse or red, either way you want to translate that, talking about Zechariah. And the other horse was speckled, palish, speckled. And then another one, uh, see what color did he use? White white. Those three colors are mentioned by Zechariah. Now, I don't want to teach Zechariah because he's dealing with something entirely different, but it's the same thing. It's these horses. Why? Why horses to begin with? That's what I want to get to you tonight, which I did not explain last week. Horses represents inner, hidden, subconscious passions. I'm going to say that again. Inner subconscious passions, the horse, but they're hidden. That's why they're sealed. This is why they're sealed. When something is sealed, you can't get in there. It takes a special person to open it. And some people liken the, the seven seals to the seven chakras that we have in our body. Well, you can use that if you want to. But here, uh, they weren't thinking Indian here, East Indian. Here, they were speaking typically Near Eastern. So seals represent something that you can't get at. The seals have to be broken, so it's hidden. So these four, we call them the horsemen. We call them the four horsemen, but it's really four horses with the horsemen. So you have to understand what do those horses represent? They represent the hidden subconscious. Conscious. I don't like the term unconscious. Nothing is unconscious. Nothing. There is no unconscious. I know, <laughs> I know Freud used it, and I also know that many of the early psych psychiatrists and psychologists also used the term unconscious, but I prefer subconscious the subconsciousness, there's, but it is conscious. It's just it hasn't broken through to the upper awareness. That's not what it hasn't had. That's why I like to call it subconscious or subconsciousness. And there's all kind, and, and Jung talked about this all the time, that in the subconscious, but he used unconscious, are these different images and this imagery that's there. It's, so consciousness is, is not just stuck up here. It's subconscious. And it, it's tied in with desires and visions. And this is what I'm going to explain to you now, the horses. So you understand that. It represents because it represents hidden forces, passions, passions. And this is the first seal that's broken. And what comes first? It says the first, I heard one of the four living creatures saying in a voice, in other words, it's the first one. It would be the first one, the lion. The lion represents another form of consciousness, another form of awareness. The sealed ones are hidden forms of consciousness, which we call subconscious, subconsciousness, and they come forth, but a seal has to be broken. Okay, but be, when it, it's getting ready to be broken, the lion is the first of the four living creatures, which means dominion. 
And I'm going to tell you why it's dominion, because the lion represents dominion. It represents strength and dominion. The lion is strength and dominion. The lion is called the, you know, the king. So the first white horse, why white? Now, it doesn't mean purity. All your conquering leaders and generals and anyone that was out in the forefront, always rode a white horse. And I remember when I first left the Roman church and got in with the Assemblies of God, and they used to teach from the book, The Revelation, they, they called the white horse Christ. And I'm going to tell you why it cannot be Christ. This is not, not Jesus on this horse, the white horse. The reason they say it is because it says that he went forth conquering and to conquer so they felt that the gospel was released for the first thing no 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 uh -uh. it means someone who wants to dominate someone who wants to dominate bring everyone under the they just had it they had it with nebuchadnezzar they had it with the persians they had it with the with the greeks and the romans all the romans they're writing forth all the time some of them do interpret this as the romans okay but and but fits more really if you're going to use romans it fits more than it does christ and i'll tell you why it can't be christ because it says he who sat on him had a bow a bow and a crown which means a kingly leader, someone who had power and authority. That's why he had a crown and a bow. When you're going to find, you, you're going to find that there's one riding on a horse later on, but that is the Christ. That is Jesus. But we have to understand what it means here. Here, it means a conquering power and you can then, even though it probably in those days, it didn't mean Rome. But here, because that's what Rome was doing, it was set forth to conquer, but so did Nebuchadnezzar. They all did. All nations try to lead to conquer, to subdue, to control, to control. This comes from the hidden passion of leaders and governments and government officials that want to control people and even the elite in business with a lot of money they want to control people control land control everything this is the white horse this is the white horse and the wider the rider are the elites in power the elite because they're coming from a subconscious passion to control all of us have this little bit of this in us families try to control other people relatives friends you know you know some people have it so strong they just got to control they got to be the ones in power this is why the answer to this horse and to this rider is the lion the lion represents the spiritual consciousness of dominion, the spiritual consciousness of strength. You see, Jesus had that, but he was a lamb. Remember, I told you they looked for, they said, oh, the lion of the tribe of Judah has conquered. He has overcome. He has won it. And when he looked to see who would, this lion, this warrior, this the lion turned out to be a lamb, which is meekness. So this dominion is not a manipulation of meekness. It means a gentleness, an understanding, an insight in working with people. It's the opposite of the white horse and the horseman with a bow and a crown seeking to conquer and continually subdue. To conquer means to subdue. That's to control. And this, and you have this in many countries today, a lot of leaders are the white horsemen. They're doing it. And generally, 
it leads to rebellion. It leads to the next horse. It leads to the next horse. So the answer to that first horse is the lion. True spiritual dominion, which does not... And we, we think of God as that way. This is why I'm getting you ready for the other passages we're going to read. No. This is the true. When you come from the true inner being and not the passion to get your will, willfulness to get all that, that's coming from the white horse, the hidden horse. But the seal is broken now and out it comes. In other words, what is being revealed to us is showing us that in our world, this is what dominates it. They, people come from that hidden people in authority. That's why crown, you got to remember crown, people in authority have the bow and they're riding the white horse and they're going to ride over you. What? To conquer, to subdue. I hope you got that now. It's coming from a thought, a thought that carries with it all the energy of the subconscious that has not bowed to the higher consciousness, which is the spirit of God and the presence of God, the true inner being that we are. We have both. We have that subconscious with all these other desires and thoughts that want to come forward. But <laughs> the more you learn about this is why the, the soul needs to be fed and we need to break through to that subconscious to get at those roots of things. In fact, that's what this whole revelation is about. It's telling us where war comes from, where hatred comes from, where racism comes from, where sexism comes from. It all comes from the subconscious because it wants to rule. But we have got to turn to the lion, to the lion, to the true, the lion who is really a lamb. And true dominion belongs to the lion, to God, to spirit, to the deeper understanding of what we are and who we are. We don't realize what humanity is, but humanity has, we're the only beings on earth that are connected both to the higher universal spiritual and also to the lower subconscious. Mm. Okay. I think now you get a clearer picture of that white horse and the rider. And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Ta, come forward and see or look. And there went out another horse. Another horse. It was red. Red stands for bloodshed. It's automatically. When you try to conquer someone, you're going to create rebels. You're going to create all kinds of problems, tremendous problems. And let me tell you, all these four horses and horsemen are linked. The moment you start one, the others join in right away. And Dr. Lamza calls it the reddish brown, which was one of that I talked about that last week. And to him who sat in it was given power to take away peace from the earth. Of course, if there's going to be war, if there's going to be bloodshed, there's no peace to take peace from the earth that people should kill one another. That's war. Should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. That's great sword means war. Talking about war here. And remember, it was the second animal that came first before the horse was released. And that was the calf or the oxen. What does that represent? that in the times of war, it's painful, it's awful, 
And the only remnants, the only remedy for it is the oxen, the calf, which means endurance, endurance and patience, endurance and patience. And we have, we've endured several big wars. Hmm? World War II, then we had those, we had the other ones right here. I tell you, these horses are still riding because it comes from the depths of humanity, it comes from their subconscious thinking and wanting greater power and subduing everyone. And it's going on right now, right now. There's a forming of it right in Europe and even our own country is being deceived by many things. Okay, that's all I'm going to say. Okay. And this horse went out. So the answer to it is, yes, you're going to have to endure it. But if you're following the inner sense, you will have, even though it would be painful, you'll be able to endure it. Okay. Then, and when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, ta, kazi, ta means come forward. Kazi means, and look or see in Aramaic. So what, what was the third living creature? The third living creature was, had the face of a man, intelligence, infinite intelligence, universal intelligence, spiritual intelligence that's why the fear of man because i told you this is what's in us the universal spirit the you this is the holy spirit this is this is the that's another term for it the spirit of holiness literally is what it says but a holy spirit is fine too so this is the third the third one that's going to work with this other one that's coming forth from the subconscious and the third animal, and behold, I saw a black horse, a black horse. The other was war, and now this is the black horse means devastation. Devastation, we would automatically think of death, but it's not. It's just devastation, destruction. That's what it means here, destruction and devastation. Everything goes into a form of change. Okay. And it's going to be rough. The land, in other words, food will be scarce. Hmm, doesn't this sound familiar? Food will be scarce because of the stupidity of our leadership. Any leadership, when we run out of that because they don't handle things right. It's the black horse. The black horse because of wanting to have dominion of wanting to force everything on everybody then that makes room for the black horse which means to be a time of deprivation that's what the black horse means time of deprivation and because of these horses riding the subconscious coming forward okay so it takes spiritual universal intelligence remember these living creatures was they were carrying the throne of god in the book of ezekiel that's where he's getting it from the writer's getting it from the book of ezekiel these four living creatures that's why i call it the living creatures and not just animals even though they did have animals on the throne and all that but they didn't have a they had the eagle they had that but you have to understand it's talking about the living, the living forces that were carrying the throne, the universal consciousness in the book of Ezekiel. So now what we get here is that only the spiritual intelligent ones will survive this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then it says, and behold, the blind, and he who sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand trying to balance everything but couldn't succeed he's riding on a black horse and i heard 
And I heard then another voice in the midst of the four living creatures. We don't know who said it, but a voice came from the four living creatures. A measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny and see that you do not damage the oil and the wine. Here it means in the midst of all of a sudden scarcity, terrible scarcity with food and things all of a sudden now. And because of a war, you know what they hurt? They hurt the oil and the wine because they devastate the farms and all that is what they do. So here it says all of a sudden it's going to be a short reprieve, a short reprieve. And this happened in the Near East, literally. A short reprieve where you can buy some wheat, where you can buy some barley, all of this, and then oil and wine. Don't hurt the oil and the wine, even though the black horse is, you know, trying to balance everything, and, but creates devastation. Okay. Then, when he opened the fourth seal, broke it. He had, he had to break it. When he opened, because you see, it, it's a seal was, it's, it's, it's stuck and you have to break it, you have to break it. And when he broke it, then another horse came forth. But I heard the fourth living creature, rather than the animal, saying, Ta Kaza, which is come forward and look or see. Okay, so what was the fourth one? The eagle, the omnipresence. In other words, you can fly above it mentally, emotionally, spiritually. That's what this other living creature represents omnipresence because the eagle flies in the air flies in the air above transcends transcends so you have to have a transcendent consciousness the one of the eagle okay and why because this is the worst horse And I looked and behold, a green horse. Dr. Lambson says the word there is green. I, you know, I didn't double check it in the Aramaic, but it, it, again, this, it's the sickening. It's just, you know, when you get sick, green, all of that comes out. He says a green horse. And the one who sat on, on this horse was death and Sheol. Death means, well, you know what death means. And Shio means the grave. Death and the grave followed after him. <laughs> it was right after him. And power was given him over a fourth part of the earth. In other words, it won't take the entire globe. It's going to take a certain portion of it. That's why it says a fourth part. It means a certain portion. And, and it never does it complete, not complete, otherwise the whole thing would go. No, it's always a fourth. That's, the Revelation talks about that all the way through. It takes just so much, so much, so much, not all of it. And power was given to him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with death and with wild beasts of the land. In other words, when all the, the, the carcasses and stuff of the people lying around, wild beasts will come. All that is produced. All these four horses and four horsemen come from the mind and subconscious incorrect forms of thought, of energy and desire. That's what the four... Any war is produced by us, by humanity, by leadership, by all that we produce all this. Hmm? We do. And as a result, this is what results. 
crops are destroyed, people are destroyed, cities are destroyed. Look what's happening right now. Cities are destroyed. Everything that's been built by humankind, blitzed, blitzed. Hmm? Okay, but it all, they don't go to the root. The root is the subconscious thinking of man that is not correct. It's imagery in that subconscious area. In that area that everything we see, all the pain we suffer when wars and hatred and racism and sexism all come out because it comes from the inner sense of man. But the healing for all of that are the spiritual understanding. The spiritual, that's what you got to get. The other form, the higher universal consciousness that is also in man. We are, what I mean by man is I mean humankind. Okay. So that's the four horsemen. And also the four living creatures, the remedy for it. Get to the universal, get to the inner sense. When things go wrong, go inner, go inner to the higher sense of consciousness. We call it higher, but I call it the inner universal sense. That universal sense is a part of us. That's where some all of this goodness comes from, too. It comes from that universal consciousness. We understand it. Okay, so now let's go deeper. See, this is why when you read Dr. Lambs's commentary and that we worked on it together, he did not mention specific countries. And he said, because it comes from the inner being of man and it changes over this over the over the years. The book of the Revelation isn't talking about our days. It's talking about what's, what is in man that creates all this and what the remedy for it is. Hmm. That's what you got to understand. And I never hear preachers talk about it that way. They talk about it. Ooh, ooh. They put fear, 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 fear in everyone. They, they don't understand it. It hurts me when I hear them. It hurts me because I know what it's doing to the consciousness of the people who are listening to it. And then they become fearful. And then they try to make everyone else fearful and say, oh, if you don't follow Christ, God's going to condemn you and burn you in hell. And you're going to roast and roast and roast. Okay. They don't understand God and they don't understand Jesus. They don't study Jesus. We study Paul and we study the book of the Revelation, but we don't study. In order to understand Revelation and Paul, you better understand Jesus. You better make Jesus' teachings as the prime target. Period. Period. Then other things will come into play. And then you'll understand the Eastern saying, of course, you have the Bible itself, you have to understand the Eastern way of speaking, which we're going to start to get into now. And now we're on, on the ninth verse. And when he opened the fifth seal, he broke it. I saw under the altar. Now, you see, here's the thing. If you don't know the Old Testament or familiar with all the figures and symbolism of the Old Testament, it's hard to understand the book of the Revelation when it says, I saw the altar. What does it mean, the altar? <laughs> this, you have to understand the tabernacle that was set up by Moses and then in the temple. Same thing, because all, all it was, the difference between the tabernacle and the temple that Solomon built, and then they rebuilt it again before the time of Jesus. It had the, the, the temple and the tabernacle had a section which is only in two, which is the holy place and the holy of holies. And outside, now I'm talking about the tabernacle, there was a white fence all the way around where all the 12 tribes of Israel were encamped all around the tabernacle. And outside this compartment, the two compartments, which was covered over with skins and certain draperies. And, but on the outside now was called the brazen altar the brazen altar. What the worshipers would do, they would come in with their turtle doves or with uh, a calf or whatever they wanted to give as part of 
sometimes a lamb, to give to the offering for the priest. They took the good meat, and what they do is cut it up. That's why the priest, besides this brazen altar, which means the fire where they would roast the meat, and there was part of the fellowship of uh, the priest would eat, and then also the worshiper. They, 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 they did this, even in the temple. That's why Jesus was there for several days, and he wouldn't have starved because he had the offerings that were given there, and, that were roasted, and they would give him some food. But you see, this was done here now in the book of the Revelation. We're going to the brazen altar where they brought all those animals that was required by the Mosaic law that you could bring and they would cook it and roast it. They would cut it up and wash it and all that. And they also had what they call the laver. The laver was they washed their hands and stuff like that because of the blood that they would use. And they would sprinkle the blood too on the worshiper and roast the animal. This is so different from when what Abraham worshiped God. Yes, he did animal roasting too, but he ate it as a food and all the people who were poor didn't have enough food. They came when Abraham did it and part of their worship was with the animal sacrifice and they ate, it fed them, okay? So here now it's talking about, when it says the altar, it's talking about the brazen altar outside the temple, the proper temple of the holy place and the holy of holies. It's, it's in the courts of the temple that the brazen altar is. So he says, I saw under the altar, the souls under the brazen altar is what it's talking about. The souls, the nausea or nausea of those who had been slain. That's why we know it's the brazen altar for the sake of the word of God and for the testimony of the lamb because of the truth of God and because of Jesus' teachings, the lamb, the meekness teachings, which they had. And they cried with a loud voice because they were under the altar saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. So how did how were they answered? They're they're saying, you know, how long are you going to let this go on? Where more and more are going to be martyred, and more and more are going to be killed. And come on. So what the, what the writer is saying is here, he wanted to give comfort to people who were perhaps already facing the idea of being martyred. And also those who have gone on. So he's telling them they're under the altar because they sacrifice their lives. He's using it as a symbol, as a symbol. And people who are awake and on and still living here, they're saying, they're the ones that are saying, how long is this going to go on? When, when will we be avenged? That's not the language. When Jesus was on the cross, what did he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And you've got to remember that, please, because we're going to come to other passages here that you won't understand unless you remember what I'm telling you right now. Father, forgive them. And they crucified him. He was dying. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. In other words, no revenge. And this is what the souls are saying, avenge us. But look what happens. What did he do? And a white robe was given to every one of them. <laughs> In other words, forget all that. Here's the white robe. You come into a whole new way of life, a white robe, purity, understanding, mm -hmm. understanding even though you lost your life and, and all those who will lose their lives. A white robe was given to every one of them and it was said to them that they should rest yet for a little while until the time should be fulfilled when their fellow servants 
and their brothers should be killed also as they had been. In other words, they're crying for <laughs> vengeance, but God doesn't reply to them that. He gives them a white robe. And he says, no, there's more yet to come because this word has got to get out. And even though they kill people, it has to get out, it has to get out. Because they don't like the message. And the only way to stop the message is kill all the messengers. Those who are talking about it. Those who are demonstrating it. Those who are manifesting. That's why they had to kill Gandhi. What was Gandhi doing? Why did he deserve a death that he died? Shot by someone of his own faith. And of his own people. His own people. Someone because it was a religious person who poisoned this mind of this person that killed Gandhi. Hmm? It, it, see, because we don't, they have religion, but they have only, in, they only have the outward institutionalized religion. And that becomes greater than the inner understanding of religion. And same thing with Christianity and all that. That's why we could go forth in the crusades and kill and do all that. And then they turn around and turn around and kill us too. <laughs> it's not the lamb it's the human being that does it because he doesn't understand what he is and what christianity is and what oh, they don't understand it it's an inner an inner spiritual understanding of life and not a materialistic understanding of life okay so he says so you, these, this is going to continue because they're going to represent and I looked, and when he had opened the sixth seal, that was, that was the fifth seal. And when he opened the sixth seal, now things are going to happen. And behold, there was a great earthquake. Great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth. They say that in the Near East. The sun, the sun wears slack, uh, sackcloth. Because when people are mourning, when people are hurting, they demonstrate it in their bodies. They will wear sackcloth. They show, oh, I'm suffering inwardly, but the sackcloth represents terrible suffering. Terrible suffering. That's an earthquake brings damage, brings all kinds of things, which means upheavals, changes in all kinds of things, upheavals. And people will suffer. That's why the sun is wearing sackcloth. <laughs> it's just Eastern imagery. The sun isn't going to put on sackcloth. It'll still keep burning in the midst of hell. It'll still keep burning in the midst of earthquakes. It'll still keep burning. The sun will give its rays and everything in all with all the floods and everything that goes on. The sun still is there. Doesn't wear sackcloth. This is the Eastern way of speaking, meaning tremendous suffering. When the sun is wearing sackcloth, tremendous suffering. And the moon became as blood. You see, for, first the sun is wearing sackcloth of hair, it says. And now the moon is turning to blood, which means loss of life. So there'll be great inner emotional inner painful suffering that's the sun with sackcloth and the moon represents people will lose their lives shed blood moon turning to blood means more wars not peace not peace more wars all coming on them and oh i see time is starting to get away with me i had to talk faster because i want to finish at least the sixth chapter and it says and the stars of heaven fell to the earth, which means that high official people lose their power. Going down to the earth means they're humiliated. They lost their sense of power because of all the upheavals and all the changes. They lose it. Hmm? So, and it says what? And, and, and then it says, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth, and even as fig trees cast its fig, its green figs, when it's shaken by a mighty wind, use that as an illustration, means 
the higher ups will also be affected by this. And the heavens separated as a scroll. <laughs> the heavens never separate. It means that when, when everything moves, it's everything is being affected. So then it says, and every mountain island shifted from its resting place. That's from the earthquake, which means even the small islands and small little powers on islands and stuff are going to be affected by it. And the mountains means high, high places. Okay. And this is all figurative speech. And 15th verse, and the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders. Now it's explaining what, what it just gave it to us in figures. It, it's explaining it now. And the kings of the earth and great men and commanders of thousands and the rich and the mighty men. Oh, the rich aren't going to get away with it, with their stupidity and what they're trying to do to dominate people. The rich are going to get it too. Not because they're rich but because of the subconscious why to want to dominate. Watch out for people who have money that are buying up lands and all kinds of things all over to dominate. That's what's happening. We're seeing this right now. It's happening today in our world, happening. I won't mention names, but I can tell you. Them. And, but I'm not going to. And the rich and the mighty men, every bond man, every free man hid themselves in caves in the ancient world that's what they did when this much trouble political trouble scarcity war famine loss of life all of that where did they hide they hide in the caves literally in the caves they went into caves and and i've been in turkey where i've, where I've been in, in places where people were living in caves living in them slept in and showed the, the beds where they would sleep in Hmm? Cappadocia, that's where we say Cappadocia, but Cappadocia, they had, they had places where they have, I have even pictures of myself with all the people that were with me right in front of some of those caves and stuff where they went and hid and people were living in the ancient world. That's where some of their homes and said to the mountains and rocks fall on us means hide us. And hide us from the face of him. Oh, here it is. Fight us. This is the verses I wanted to get at. And from the, from the face of him who sits on the throne. And from the wrath of the lamb. What? In other words, this is brought on by the one who's sitting on the throne. That's what we started with in the fourth chapter. And which of course prefigures the omnipotence of the spiritual force of God, okay? But the wrath of the lamb, does the lamb have wrath? For the great, for the great day of his wrath is come, judgment day, judgment day. And who shall be able to stand? Who can take it? Who can go through it? Okay, so what does this mean? This is why I read to you at the beginning what I did. I wanted to remind you we're dealing with figures of speech. The, the lamb does not have wrath. People interpret it that way. The wrath of the lamb. What did the lamb say when he was on the cross? Did he call down wrath on the people? Did he say, Father, avenge me and fix these people? See how stupid they were? And what they're doing, they're killing life and everything else like, no, 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 no. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And that's what I say to all these guys and people in government, people in big business and trying to control and have manipulate people and move everyone under that. Even though that's what they're trying to do and may succeed in some areas because they are doing things that are succeeding. Okay, so what do we do? But there's gonna be nothing but trouble as a result of it, nothing but trouble. And the, it will affect them too. They think they're gonna get away with it, it will affect them too. Hide us from, and the trouble is, they shouldn't be hidden from the face of God. 
They need the face of God and they need the lamb. They need the lamb. They need the meekness. They need that to transform them. They need that to change them. But in those days, when things go wrong, when wars break out, they figured God allowed it. So, and since the lamb is sitting at the right hand of the father of God, then it's also the wrath of the lamb. That's how they talked in those days. This is exactly how they did it. The lamb has no wrath. He's not after vengeance. He's not after revenge. We do that. When we do crooked things, those things come back right on us. It won't last. And there'll always be groups that will rebel against what something is forced. Something is forced. It, it will not work. It'll only work temporarily. Only work. And then wars break out and rebellion breaks out and secret things go on and all. And then bloodshed happens and war and then famine and then da -da 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 -da, all that. That is why I don't like to read the book of the Revelation. I want to go into the positive end of it, into where we need to be, where we need to wake up, wake up. Not this silly woke stuff, but really wake up to the true inner sense of being. The true inner sense of love, the true inner sense of compassion, the true inner sense that every human being on the face of the earth is my brother, my family, and that they deserve life just like I deserve it and you deserve it. Everyone deserves life and peace and joy and understanding not to be manipulated or to come under someone else's control. Mm, big difference big difference this and this is what to be to be taught in the churches this is what we need help today get to our souls not about our sins this is the worst sin the worst sin is the sin of ignorance we're, we are ignorant of our true inner beings where the four living creatures are where all of this is where the king God has no throne. He's not sitting on a throne in the heavens watching us and seeing all the stupid things we're doing. No, he's not doing that. It's the universal consciousness always working to awaken man and to bring him to the truth. And when I say man, I mean human beings, all human beings, women, men, children, everyone, everyone to awaken to their true sense of being. Okay, that. That's enough for tonight. <laughs> I did finish the sixth chapter. We'll go now to the seventh chapter. This is still the, only the second major vision. All right, let's go to questions. Let me see what I have here. I, I don't have anything, Ravi. Okay, I have some here. Let me go to it. Whoop. All right. Medically, the term unconscious used woman is in a coma. Yeah, but in psychology, they use it for the unconscious. How would you term conscious? What is the state of consciousness of one who is in a coma? Did you ever read the near-death experience of um, that doctor's name? Always leaves me every time I go to think of him. He was, he was, in, the, he was in an unconscious state, but yet he was seeing all kinds of things. All kinds of things. And he wrote a book on his near-death experience that, that, that he, that because they couldn't get through him on a conscious level. But in that unconscious state, he was in another world completely. And he saw things and he, you can get his book. I'm sorry, I can't think of his name right now. <laughs> Maybe some of you can. All right, Eben, Eben is his first name and his last name gone from me. Okay, he's a medical doctor. He was a, a brain surgeon and he, he dealt with it. He's wonderful, just wonderful. A one who is in a coma, is it similar to the consciousness we take with us when, 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 when we are in transition? Yes, similar. But some people, 
are not fully awake when they're in in that state too. They're, they're asleep for months and then when they come to that they, they haven't had any experience. Some are more awake than others, okay? But it, the consciousness is always there. It's always there. All right, let me go. The next one. All right, that's a question. Next one. Who was the audience for this? It is so esoteric and seemingly hidden in terms of meaning. No, it's because it's near Easton. It seems that way to us because we this, these are not our term. This is not our terminology. This is not our visions. This is not our culture. Everything in here, everything in here is typically near Eastern. It's not ours. It's not a part of us. The only reason why I know it is because I was with Dr. Lamza and, and I showed you his picture in the beginning. He's the one who taught me all this. He's the one who opened my eyes. He's the one who helped me see the culture, helped me understand and being living it. Even though he lived in the States, I'm telling you the Near Eastern culture lived in him. I had to come under him just like, even though I was a part. When I say come under, I mean, as he was my mentor and I was the student and I was in my twenties and he, and I could see things and understand things because he lived them. He expressed them all the time. And when he talked, he talked just like that too. He was of another age. It's like he came out of another world. Not just, not just today. He lived in the States, but let me tell you, the Near East lived in him and expressed to him all the time. And I had to get used to him even when he talked to me. Okay. Uh, remember, who were the listeners? There were, the listeners were the early followers of Jesus. That's why the martyrdom is expressed there. People were suffering. They were in trouble and they wanted to hear, understand all of this. Okay, then how did you think they obtained this knowledge? They didn't have they understood that it was their own culture. If I talked about a taxi cab and certain things happening in a taxi cab, would you need a, a book or a seminar to attend to understand about a taxi cab? Come on now. It's again Near Eastern. I'll tell you, folks, the Bible wasn't written to us, but it was written to Near Eastern people. They understand a lot of this. Okay. Uh, and, and even now they've gotten away with the modern, modern people, even modern Syrians and Assyrians, and they don't get it because they're not a part of that anymore. They're more of our culture and more of the West because of the West's advent in, in the Near East. And how do you think it obtained its knowledge? Was it a form of channeling or simply a message that he wanted to convey to the, it was a message that he wanted to convey to his people that needed it, to his people that needed it. Okay, let's go on. Was the book of the four horses based on Revelation? Yes, strictly, but he, he didn't do the complete job. He didn't do the living creatures. He just showed war and famine and all that. And he, he likened to what Spain was going through at that time. And he wrote this novel about, the, and he called it The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. And, um, and then, like I told you, they made movies of it. You can probably get those movies online or look for them is, was his interpretation correct no <laughs> no it, he made it the present day and let me tell you it's more than the present day it had i'm telling you, you did you hear what i said tonight it has to do with the inner subconsciousness in man that's the root of it we'll always have wars we'll always have all the four horses riding as, as, long as, as long as we do not take care of the inner sense of man, of human beings, we will continue to have this. That's what's wrong with some of these big business people that want to form these new ideas of controlling everything, changing everything. We're there in power. <laughs> yeah, they have the money. They have the, they're the elite. They have the money. They can control you and do what they want to do. Mm-hmm. And you, poor sucker, and me, poor sucker, we fall for it. No, 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 no. And we have to watch that. This is why America was formed for freedom, for freedom from that. But we seem to be bending to it. So let's let's continue now. Well, let me see if there's any more. Uh, you mentioned previously the importance of being clean in thought, actions, and before being able to enter into the inner consciousness. What is your view on Holy Communion? Communion has something else that has to do with celebrating Jesus. Is there a practice you would recommend? Uh, 
to the sadhana or kriya taught by the Indian yogis. Well, I, I don't work with that. What I do is simple the way Jesus said it. Repent, turn to God. Turning to God, humbling yourself, you become cleansed. Get off a high horse, get off the pride, get off of all the things you think you know, your hot stuff or anything like that. That is how we do it. If you want to go East Indian way, go East Indian way. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't do it. I do it the simple way. I follow the scriptures. I follow Jesus' teaching. The word repents, turn to God. Turn to God. Turn to that inner life. It's there. And that will, will cleanse you when, you when you do something that you shouldn't be. Then if you want to practice those others, go ahead. But I don't. I just do it from within my own being. I follow Jesus. That's it. It's simple. I try to follow the simple thing. Just like people say, sitting in a lotus position. Oh, that'll help you with the, with the chakras. And all well, yes, it does. But I don't care. When you worship God, you can lie on your back, sit in a chair, lie on the floor, stand up, do anything you want. It comes from your inner being. It comes from your inner being. That's what you got to get to. We're so used to living outside, outside, outside and, and doing things and fixing yourself in certain positions to get God to come in. Oh, come on now. The, the universal mind is born in us. It's born in us. It's just that we become materialistic minded and we're always looking out there to do something. Oh, give me the magic movement. Give me the magic position. Give me the magic thing that will change me. No, 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 no. It's simple, simple. Just turn to God, turn to love, turn to peace, turn to, it's there, it's in us, it's a part of us. That is a true Christian. What is a Christian? A Christed one. A Christed one means an anointed person, a person who manifests a God-like nature, which means goodness and love and peace and joy and endurance and patience. Yeah, is, is that clear enough? See, we're so full of uh, so many other ideas that we can't become simple. We're too overloaded. We're overloaded. What was the form of practice in the ancient Near East? Repentance. Got it? Could this be a special discussion on a Wednesday evening? <laughs> no. It's just, I just said it so simply to you right now. We don't need a whole Wednesday evening for it. Okay. Thank you. Very enlightening. Uh, that's it. There's the doctor's name. Even Alexander. I can never remember his last name. I remember even better than I do Alexander. Because it's a first name too. Even Alexander. His books are available on, on Amazon. I'll tell you what happened to him when he was in that coma state. <laughs> Go ahead and, and read his books. They're absolutely good. And a brain surgeon he was. Yes. And okay. Does hellfire mean? Can't read it. There it is. Does hellfire mean mental torment and regret? Yes, that's what it means. Not a place where God is roasting people. All right. Yeah, there's another game. Even <laughs> I got several of them with the name Even Alexander. And the name of the book is Proof of Heaven. He's got it's under seven names there. Okay. Is this what is meant by the lion and the lamb shall lay down together? No, no. The, in Isaiah, the lion and the lamb means. The powerful nations will learn to get along with weaker, smaller nations. Smaller nations that do not have much power, much resources, much things like that, uh, will get along instead of being subdued by the powerful na by the powerful nations, they will get along with, with them and not try to subdue the weaker nations, the lamb. That's when it says the lamb and the lion lying down together. No, that's something altogether different. That is in Isaiah. Isaiah says that, which means so much truth is in the nations now. They'll not try to conquer other nations, especially ones that are easier to conquer. <laughs> okay. Which we're seeing today. Mm -hmm. All right. And let's see one more question. Rocco, could you please give an idea of what Jesus meant when he said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind. 
what did he understand with the mind and the heart? Okay. And, you know, I'm going way over. It's already 810. So what I will do, I mustn't forget this. I got to write it down. Uh, what does it mean? I will do this next week, okay? To love God with all your mind and heart. And what does the mind and heart mean? This, it's really simple, okay? All right, folks. I'm going to have to say <laughs> night for tonight. And uh, I hope I wasn't too strong, but I tell you, I, I had to get it out. So now you're looking at the book of the Revelation in a different way. Love you. Take care. Stay healthy. Oh, I almost forgot. This Sunday, I'm speaking at the Unity Church. If you go on our, on our um, website, you will find... And I'm speaking on the Gospel of John and uh, going through the Gospel of John. And it's at Eastern time at a quarter of 10 to quarter of 11. Okay. And that's when it'll open up and I, and I go for that hour then. You're welcome to, to get on it. You just go to our website and there's the link if, if you want to. All righty. Bless you, everyone. See you next week. Bye-bye.